Thank you, Alex. Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see you all. We are up to a limit in person of 50 people or groups capacity, and it feels fuller than that, maybe because it's been so long since we've been together in person and online. This is our third week of trying in-person worship, and hello to all of you. Hello to those watching online live or later. I am so glad to see you. This is Rincon Congregational United Church of Christ, based out of Tucson, Arizona, but wherever you're joining us from, whoever you are, and whenever you're watching this, welcome. Whether LGBTQIA, all abilities, black, brown, white, or a bit of each, man, woman, or a bit of both, older, younger, or a bit of both, welcome. We strive to make this safe space and we claim a living God, a spirit among us who loves you unconditionally. And whether in person or online or a bit of both, welcome this morning. I hope this is a time of peace and pause, reflection and encouragement, challenge and affirmation with music, message, prayer, and each other's company. Before we get going with that, though, I realized, thanks to Margaret Douglas, that this morning I get to do something I haven't done in a long, long time that I may have forgotten how to do, so forgive any wrinkles here. Do we have anyone new <laughs> joining us for worship today who would like to make themselves known? Don't worry, we're not going to give you a car like Oprah, and we're not giving out free vaccine shots, though I hope you all are vaccinated. But we do have something a little special. I know who you are. I'm not going to out you, though. <laughs> yes. Oh, George, were you ra scratching your eye or raising your hand? No? All right. Yes, hello. Hi, I'm Marjorie Johnson. Uh, I just moved here recently from Chicago. And I'm a member of the United Church of Christ. Marjorie, welcome. We do have something for you and it's coming your way. Uh, anyone else? Well, to those watching online, I'm sure over the course of 15 months, we had just nonstop loyal viewership to our Patreon subscribers. I think I said early on in the pandemic, wherever you are, if you join us in person in Tucson, at any point in the past 15 months and find yourself here, we will be sure to welcome you with open arms as if it's your first time as well. Um, we have upped our game. I hope for you watching online that our audio and visual is feeling better quality and for all of us here. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Seth Whispelway. I am the interim pastor here at Rincon. Please rise as you're able and willing in body and spirit for this morning's call to worship. And please remain standing for the hymn after this. Come into this household of the living God, the three in one. Gather in the wonder of the mystery that God has invited us to share in. We have come as the family of Christ, led by the Spirit of God. Our hope is that in this time of worship and learning, we might embrace what lies beyond our imagination and understanding. O oh God of mercy, within your very self you model the beloved community. You are the wisdom within our hearts, the word who dwells among us, the spirit who calls us beyond ourselves. Let us know your presence here today in a new way, that we might celebrate your love and go forth rejoicing with the prophet Isaiah, saying, here am I, send me. Let us 
us join with faithful songs our song of faith to raise. His heart are we, and one the God is face. Faithful of all who love the truth and perfect truth proclaim, who steadfast stand at God's right hand and glorify God's name. And faithful hearts, a gentle heart, to whom the power is given of every heart to save the sin, of every home ahead. O God of hosts, our faith renew and grant us in your grace. Join the song sung by the saints in every time and place. You all may be seated. This is a moment we take a few minutes every week to pause and reflect and check in with ourselves, preparing or at least noticing how our spirits are doing, and particularly the ways in which they might not be okay. Organizing it's okay to not be okay, but noticing the ways in which we might not have done as well the week before as we would have liked, or just the weight, and there's a lot of weight out there, and there's a lot of weight that accumulated this past year the ways that carries with us in here and bringing it before God and with each other. We call this different names, confession. I call it honesty time, um, but it's a time to breathe and in so doing walk through the rest of what this service, scripture, message, music has to center us in and for the rest of the week. So will you all please pray corporately with me Holy God, creator of life. You call us out of our dark places, offering us the grace of new life. When we see nothing but hopelessness, you surprise us with the breath of your spirit. Call us out of our complacency and routines. Set us free from our self-imposed bonds and fill and us, us with, with your, your spirit, spirit of life, life compassion, compassion, and peace. In the name of Jesus, your anointed one, we pray. Amen. Take a few moments now in silence to connect further with our still speaking God. Living God, we come no longer in fear and trembling, but seeking the embrace of your love, the smile of your acceptance, the touch of your forgiveness. We dare to come close to you because you have come close to us. God, the spirit of life, we are thankful for your constant presence, for the healing of your love, for the challenge of your word for the inspiration of your gospel, good news for the community of your church. Renew us and refresh us, enable us and enliven in us, challenge us and change us, prompt us and improve us in our worship, in our mission, and in our service in the name of you, God, amen. And now, in a way that I think fits with the theme of the past few weeks, certainly today's scripture, 
the whole past year and a half, and just because we like it, we're going to bring back a song that is easy to learn or relearn, and then it turns into a round. It's called Courage. The song uh, lyrics are, there we are. Uh, and so there's a bit of a response and then a togetherness, and then uh, Greg and I are going to have us sing it to each other. So just repeat after me. Courage. Courage. My friends. My friends. You do not walk alone. We will. We will. Walk with you. Walk with you. And sing your spirit home. We'll go through it together. Courage. Courage. My friend. My friend. You do not walk alone. We will. We will. Walk with you. Walk with you. And sing your spirit home. So what we're going to try to do is I'll take this side. Greg will help lead this side, and so we'll do like courage, and then you respond with courage. We will, we will. This South African freedom song was a way of keeping the paces going in the fight against apartheid, and it's something that has informed movement, voices, and advocacy, and embodied solidarity for a good time. And it just is also just a centering time after confessing and assurance and all oh, we've been through to sing to each other, especially since we can't necessarily hug. At least don't tell anybody if you are. All right. Ready? So we're going to sing together, and they're going to respond. Sing together, you and like us, they're going to respond. Then we're all going to sing together. It's simple. You'll get it. Ready? <clears throat> Courage, Courage, my friend. You do not walk alone. We will, we will walk, with you walk with you and sing your spirit home. Come on, I can hear them a lot more. Courage, Courage. my friend. You do not walk alone. We will walk with you and sing your spirit home. One more time. Courage, my friends. Sorry. <laughs> This is live. We're not going to edit it. We'll have outtakes in the garden later. Sorry. I got really excited and I bumped it up a key like we're at some like stadium country concert. We'll do it one more time. Okay. <laughs> in the usual key. <laughs> so much courage, guys. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm saying that to myself. Ready? One, two, three. Just delete that. All right. Courage, my friend, you do not walk alone. We will walk with you and sing your spirit home. Thank you. That did sound and was lovely. It's simple enough that you'll probably find yourselves humming it as you walk your paces this week. And I find that it provides soul breath, just as doing it with all of you does as well. All right. I think we are going to listen to some scripture. This is a church. So here we go. The scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3 verses 20 through 35. 
And it begins uh, after Jesus has called his disciples and then gone back home. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his siblings came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your siblings are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my siblings? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my siblings. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and siblings and mother. Will you all please bow and pray with me? Living, still speaking God, thank you for dwelling among us. We have wondered with you and with each other and deep and often in the darkest places of our own souls what that even means after the past many hard, isolating months. So we hold the space for all the ways and all the ways we bring in that may be okay or not be okay, because there's a lot to work through. And so God, make this a safe space for all of it and make my own words an avenue for understanding who we are in it. In Jesus' name, amen. I talk a lot about aliveness, belovedness, our universal status as divine image bearers, what claims that claiming a relationship with Jesus does to us, and more. Fascism also, white supremacy. I have a feeling when it's like my last Sunday and if we throw some big party, right? We're gonna throw a party, right? Someone's gonna have like the top 10 Sethisms. I'm fully aware of what things I repeat a good bit. They say it takes like 15 times for it to really sink in, right? So today I want to dive deeper, building off the past few weeks of extrapolating how we understand our faith calling into who we are so that we can both, who we are, I don't have my glasses on, outtake, again, calling into who we are that can be both tended to and understood as someone who can live out the faith calling we've been unpacking the past couple weeks. We've talked a good bit about what the prophets call us to, Pentecost and the tongues of fire, what does that mean? So how do we understand ourselves as people who can embody the call of faith? Two eyes work well together, so do glasses, and they're crucial 
for a lot having both working together because they make depth perception possible. The same goes for ears and the direction of sound location and more examples. And we often say that two heads are better than one because we know that insight from multiple perspectives adds wisdom. And in the United Church of Christ, we often say two committees are better than one simply because we can. <laughs> UCC jokes. Now the same is true with stories. We can best think of the Bible not as one tidy story with many chapters, but as a wild and fascinating library with many stories told from many perspectives. On any given subject, these multiple stories challenges, challenge us to see life from a variety of angles, adding depth, a sense of direction, and wisdom. So, we're given four Gospels to introduce us to Jesus. We're given dozens of parables to introduce us, to illustrate Jesus' message. And right at the beginning, we're given two different creation stories to help us know who we are, where we came from, and why we're here. How does this relate to today's scriptural passage? Stay tuned and find out. Now, according to the first creation story, you, yes you, are part of creation. You are made from common soil, dust. Genesis says stardust, astronomers tell us. Soil that becomes watermelons and grain and apples and peanuts. And then they become food, and then that food becomes you. As highly organized dust, you are closely related to frogs and tortoises and lions and field mice and bison and elephants and gorillas. Together with all living things, you share the breath of life, participating in the same cycles of birth and death, reproduction and recycling and renewal. You, with them, are part of the story of creation, different branches on the tree of life. In that story, you are connected and related to everything everywhere. In fact, that is a good partial definition of God. God is the one through whom we are related and connected to everything. In the first creation story, we learn two essential truths about ourselves as human beings. First, we are good. We are good. Along with our fellow creatures, we were created with a primal, essential goodness that our creator appreciates and celebrates. And second, we all bear God's image. Non-binary folks and women and men and girls and boys, toddlers and elders and teenagers, poor and yes, the rich, popular or misunderstood, powerful or vulnerable, Whatever our religion or race or marital status or orientation or nationality or culture, we all bear God's image without exception. What is the image of God? An image is a small imitation or echo, like a reflection in a mirror. So if we bear the image of God, then like God, we experience life through relationships. Like God, we experience love through our complementary differences. Like God, we notice and enjoy and name things, starting with the animals, our companions on this earth. Like God, we are caretakers of the garden of the earth. And like God, we are naked and not ashamed meaning we can be who we are without fear. Back in ancient times, this was a surprising message. Maybe, hopefully, it still is. 
Yes, kings and other powerful men were seen and often sanctified as image bearers of God and often as God in human form. After all, since they were powerful, rich, sophisticated, and civilized, electable, they could reflect God's power and glory, it was thought, and that's how it was understood. But in Genesis, the term is applied to a couple of naked and quote-unquote uncivilized hunter-gatherers, a simple couple of people presenting as woman and man living in a garden with no pyramids or skyscrapers or economies or religions or technological inventions or even clothing to their credit. Centuries later, Jesus said something similar. The creator loves every sparrow and every wildflower. And so how much more precious is every person, no matter how small, frail, or seemingly insignificant? Every person is a good. Every person in every culture and identity has value. Every person bears the image of God. It's all good. But that's not the only story. The second creation account, which many scholars think is a much older one, describes another dimension to our identity. In that account, the possibility of not good also exists. God puts the first couple of people in a garden that contains two special trees. The Tree of Life, also one of my favorite movies, is theirs to enjoy, but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life is a beautiful image, suggesting health, strength, thriving, fruitfulness, growth, vigor, and all we mean by aliveness. But what might the second tree signify? There are many answers, no doubt, but consider this possibility. The second tree could represent the desire to play God and judge parts of God's creation, all of which God considers considered good. It might invite us to be tempted to play God and judge parts of God's creation that God deemed as good as evil. Do you see the danger? God's judging is always fair, wise, true, merciful, and restorative. But our judging is frequently ignorant, biased, retaliatory, and devaluing. So when we judge, we inevitably misjudge. If we humans start playing God and judging good and evil, how long will it take before we say this person or group is good and deserves to live, but that person or group is evil and deserves to die or become our slaves. This is clearly rhetorical, the historical record couldn't be reached for comment. How long will it take before we judge this species of animal is good and deserves to survive, but that one is worthless and could be driven to extinction or eaten Pigs are just as smart, if not smarter, than dogs. And we cage them in like awful factory farms, right? These are big questions. How long until we judge this land as good and deserves to be preserved, but that river is without value and can be plundered, polluted, or poisoned? If we eat from the second tree, we become more violent, hateful, and destructive. We will turn our blessing to name and know into a license to kill, to exploit, and to destroy both the earth and other people. God sees everything as good, but we will accuse more and more things of being evil. In so doing, we will create in ourselves the very evil we claim to detect in others. In other words, the more we judge and accuse, 
the less we will reflect God and the less we will fulfill our potential as image bearers of God. This came up in a lot of conversations with fellow white liberals in Charlottesville when the white supremacists were coming. Some of y'all have heard me say this before. It's pretty clear that white supremacists are accusing non-white men of being outside God's favor. We are on the receiving end of a lot of that violence and hate, right? So our purpose and what we were trying to convince our fellow Christians to do was stand up and reflect the image of God back to them, right? That that is how we are called to love them. when they were calling everything that wasn't white male supremacy as evil and worthy of violence and accusation. So the second creation story presents us with our challenge as human beings. We constantly make a crucial choice. Do we eat from the tree of aliveness so that we continue to see and value the goodness of creation? and so reflect the image of the living God? Or do we eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, constantly misjudging and playing God, and as a result, mistreating our fellow creatures? It's a good and beautiful thing to be an image bearer of God. It is a good and beautiful thing. And it's also a big responsibility. This is how we're building off the past couple weeks. We can use our intelligence to be creative and generous or to be selfish and destructive. We can use our physical strength to be creative and generous or to be selfish and destructive. We can use our sexuality to be creative and generous or to be selfish and destructive. We can use our work, our money, our time and our other assets to be creative and generous or to be selfish and destructive. Think of your hand. It can make a fist or it can extend in peace. It can wield a weapon or it can play a violin. It can point in derision or it can reach out in compassion. It can steal or it can serve. If the first creation story is about the gift of being human, the second story is about the choice all humans live with, day after day. To be alive means to bear responsibly the image of God. It means to stretch out your hand to take from the tree of aliveness and to join in God's creative healing work. Now, Jesus, his family, or who is my family? Beelzebul, Gesundheit. There's so much to unpack in this potent section of story, parable, and sayings with Jesus, scribes, followers, and family that we heard today, and what's going on in Mark here, and in general, at the start of Jesus' ministry. But what I want us to take away from all of this for today and this week is how we understand our role in naming good and evil. I hope it's been helpful to get back to the basics because we hear a lot of like, what is Jesus saying and who are we and what does it mean to be church and these are the calls and it's overwhelming. You are good. You have an image that is good. What are we hoping to reflect and choose? And so we see in today's scripture the same kind of two stories, right? Jesus says in today's scripture, truly I tell you, people will be forgiven their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. Remember, God sees it as good and we bear God's image. But, Jesus continues, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, someone we've been talking a good bit about the past few weeks, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Whew. In Mark, forgiveness has a limit, and that limit is reached 
When those inspired by the Holy Spirit, like Jesus, remember they said he had an unclean spirit and they're accusing him. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit and they're calling it evil. This is what Jesus is saying is the unforgivable. So the limit of forgiveness is reached when those inspired by the Holy Spirit are maligned as being in league with evil. Because then those people are actively profaning God. And what is God? Good. Care in judging the inspiration that motivates people is important. Especially if one is inclined to make a negative judgment. Because it is forgivable to wrongly judge evil as good. We do it all the time but it is unforgivable to judge the good as evil is what is being said here. What is good? We talked about this last week, the exhortations and the truth-telling specifics about what the world needs that are brought forth by the prophets, inspired by and voicing God's dreams. Justice, mercy, Humility, Micah 6, 8, God's told you what is good. God has told us what is good. Those that are touched by, inspired by, and compelled by the Holy Spirit to act in these ways, in specific ways that manifest justice, mercy, and humility, a lot of the specific things I listed off last week, they know the good, live the good, and name the good. We might get it wrong sometimes, but who is always and eternally against God kind of wrong that Jesus is talking about here? Remember that Satan, Satan, in the Greek just means adversary. Against God are those who slander these good things. Justice, mercy, humility who fight against them physically, but also in policy, systemically. Health care for all is a good. Calling it evil, as plenty of people do in this country, evil is to be guilty of an eternal sin, if we want a current example to stand with queer folks and people of color and women on the receiving end of so much hate and violence is a good. Those who are slandering them, evil. God takes a side in these things. Why can I be so sure because the tree of aliveness is pretty clear that it wants investment in life for all. We could go through all sorts of callings and specifics similarly, but to close, how can we be supported in keeping our focus and choices in church on the tree of aliveness? By being image bearers, which we are. Image bearers like God, which means rooted in relationship holding the spirit in holy balance and tension between us because their wisdom is born and boosted. Learning more about what is knowledge we need to name, what is good. I will shout out the book group that's going to come alive this summer put together by our faith development and justice and witness teams that's going to go deeper into the questions of what it even means to acknowledge that we are on occupied Tohono O'odham land. We're going to figure out what that is to name. That's a good thing. Knowledge. Learning why this flag in our sanctuary might be damaging to our mission, on top of it being a heretical apostasy. In relationship. Learning what Jesus has to say about and live and do together. Doing it together. We are now more and more back in person together. These three weeks we've talked about tongues of fire, burning coals, and now the true kindred of Jesus. They're all connected. You, in naming and claiming Rincon 
as a place of Christ-like transformation are connected to these calls. Let's keep connecting so we can live into them authentically, bravely, truly, with aliveness, so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. The new family constituted by those who do God's will, siblings undivided, this is our call. You are image bearers of this family in relationship. Amen? Amen. God is the giver of life. Christ is the gift sent to share our life. And the Holy Spirit, the power that enables us to continue in generosity, justice, and joy. Let us open our hearts and our lives to God and one another. Your offerings may be placed in the basket by the entrance on your way out. For those of you watching online, please consider sharing your gifts to sustain Rincon's mission and ministries through our website, rinconucc.org. Thank you for your generosity during these trying times. stand. <clears throat> Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, each made holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, we are your living sanctuary. So where we are a sanctuary, each made holy, loved right through, with thanksgiving, we'll be a living sanctuary. Amen. Gather as you like, no masks required, but always be comfortable and conscientious towards your neighbors in the prayer garden afterwards. Also, exit in a way that provides good distance and everything. Uh, to those online, this will be posted to our YouTube page in a little bit. Thank you all for being here. Now, siblings of Christ, go into all the world. Go forth with forgiveness and grace. Go forth with compassion and love. We go family for all the world to see. Awesome. Amen.